Hey, what is up, everybody? Welcome back to a special Sunday night edition of The Oil Market is Crashing. Um, it is <laughs> 8, and oil is currently down about 20% after the Sunday night open. So um, it looks like the volatility that has come to visit us in 2020 is continuing. Uh, yeah, Sam, uh, I made short. a quick post on Twitter, and... Uh, Jacob just sent a, an image or a GIF of the Simpsons with the sign that everything is going to zero. And that certainly seems to be uh, the case right now. So just position yourself for everything going to zero, and you're probably going to be good. Just, yeah, make sure you get paid. So just make sure you get paid in the end. <laughs> don't, don't bet on bonds going to zero. Bet on yields going to zero, though, right? Right. Yes. Hold the bonds. <clears throat> All right, so um, what I wanted to do uh, tonight is get back um, to the back testing stuff with that uh, the system that Adrian kind of brought to us that we started with at the beginning of the season. Um, and what we're going to do is show a back test using the portfolio that we talked about last week. So I took all of the um, all of the markets that you talked about, all the ones I talked about and then made a 20 market portfolio. Um, so I think I did add a few extra things since we kind of had some markets that we both mentioned. Yeah. Uh, let me, um, I'll pull up the portfolio here. Are you looking at my uh, screen now? Um, I see blackness right now, but now I see your screen, yes. Okay, so um, here's our portfolio, um, the Retail Trader's Guide to Systematic Trend Following Hybrid Portfolio. Um, so what I've had to do here, some of these mini and micro contracts that we talked about don't have a lot of trading history. Uh, for example, that micro um, S&P 500 contract just started last year. So if you just stick that into a back test, you're not going to get any results other than the last I guess, 18 months or so. Um, so anything that has a limited trading history, what I've done is I've created like a synthetic market where it uses the price history for the big contract that's been around a long time. And then I've used the sizing of the mini or micro. So what that'll let us do is look at a 20-year back test. And while we couldn't have traded this way in real life, it'll let us see what would happen had we been able to do it. So it'll it, it'll kind of give us a good estimate of what this may look like going forward. Um, and I'm trying to think if there's anything I added in here. I know there's something I added in here that we didn't talk about just to make a 20 market portfolio. Uh, maybe coffee and lean hogs. I don't think we we touched on those, but I think everything else is something that we mentioned. Yeah, uh, I uh, can't remember if we discussed much on copper. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. So I added copper. So we had an industrial metal to go along with our precious metal being gold. Um, but I think. Yeah, everything else uh, looks familiar. Yeah. Yeah, and this is a pretty good rounded um, 20 market portfolio. I didn't put the Bitcoin in because Bitcoin has a limited trading history. And even the Bitcoin cash contract is not, you know, maybe 10 years old. Uh, so I didn't include that, but we can look at that later. Um, so along with this, let me just go and I'll show... Um, what the parameters were, just as a reminder. So this is that um, breakout entry, moving average ATR exit. So we're using the 200-day uh, the moving average, and then we have a 4.5 ATR trailing exit below that 200-day moving average. We're using a 250-day breakout entry, and then we're going to put on a 4.5 ATR stop, initial stop that's fixed. And then as the trade moves in our direction, um, as that moving average moves up above the price where we got in, you know, eventually that um, that 
trailing exit will take over and let us um, follow the trend with a very loose exit. Um, since we're only using 20 markets, 2% um, risk is um, feasible to do. You're not going to get in too much trouble. And I'll go ahead and show the test, and you can see um, just kind of from the highlights. So I, I started this in the year 2000 with um, – see how much money it was. I think it's $100,000. Yeah, so $100,000 starting equity. And um, in 20 years, that turned into $1.5 million. 14.5% uh, compounded annual growth rate and a 43% drawdown. And this, I mean, this is a pretty darn good system. Um, you're not going to find much in trend following. I think that's too much better than this. To have a less than 50% drawdown, a near 15% compounded annual growth rate is pretty good. And this does not include interest. So um, I ran the test with, with adding in interest income as well. And that bumped it up over 17%. So um, I think it, the, the CAGR went to 17 and the max total drawdown went to 40. So pretty good. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be, I would definitely be happy with that. Um, the only, I would say, downfall of this is it's only 285 trades. So it's not making a lot of trades. It's hard to say with a lot of certainty that this is statistically significant. Um, but if you would run this and vary the parameters a little bit, maybe you know, 20% on each parameter in, in either direction, you could get a sample size of a total test that's up over 1,000 trades, mm -hmm. and you're going to see results that are pretty similar. Um, I, I don't think I cherry-picked this one. I didn't run like a big test to see which the best results were. This just happened to be what I did, and the results were pretty good. So. Um, this is what the, the linear equity curve looks like. And you can see in the last few years, it's gotten very volatile. Um, at one point, this was up around over $2 million. And it's, it's been in a drawdown since January of 2018. But um, like you are probably aware, if you're watching this, trend following has had kind of a rough last couple of years. So that's kind of to be expected. Um, and here is one of the things that, um, I really wanted to show that I found this week. This is a sector performance chart. So you can see how each one of the sectors has done over the life of the test. Um, here's your color scale here. And then down here, can you see all this stuff, Sam? Oh, uh, yes. So down here we have the key to the, um, to these colors here. So the, the blue one is AGS, the green is foreign exchange, the black line is grains, the kind of olive color is energy, red is equities, six is metals, which is kind of like a darker green, um, seven is bonds, and eight is stir, which is this the red line. Um, so you can see that every um, every sector has contributed positively over the life of this test, except for the black line, which is grains. Um, so that's kind of an interesting an interesting thing. And that's um, because they've been getting killed for the last almost decade. Yeah. And it's only been since 2016 that this became negative, though it was negative back uh, in the mid 2000s too. Um, you can see here the total risk. It, this gets up near 60% open risk at times, which is kind of high, but um, the drawdown hasn't been terrible. Um, and what I've been looking a lot at lately is the R return. Um, and particularly th this end of this. So these are your big, you know, 10R plus trades. And you can see this system has a big contribution of profit from those big 
long, um, massive trends. And that's what we want with trend following, particularly long-term trend following. That's what you want is those big, you know, 10 R plus trades, meaning you're making 10 times your money that you outlaid, uh, when you put the trade on. Um, so, um, uh, just quick yearly returns. This was positive every year up until 2011. Um, and then 2016 was a down year. And then you can see 18 and 19, both pretty big down years. So I would say this is pretty in line with, um, you know, kind of the, I wouldn't say the industry average, but this is not a, this is a pretty typical trend following system, I would say. Um, so I shared this stuff with some other people that I kind of communicate with, uh, throughout the week, uh, Adrian being one of them. And so he, what he asked me to do is he's like, I would like to see that sector performance chart, uh, split off between, um, the longs and the shorts. Um, so I can do that really quick. I haven't done it yet because this, this will change and you won't be able to see which ones or which. I'm going to come here and we'll look at the longs first. So this will just only trade the long side. And this, um, I'm not sure why this is a, a, a piece of code that I found in the trading blocks uh, user forum and then modified to make work. Uh, why it doesn't automatically populate these sectors on the chart, I'm not sure. That's something I'm going to have to work on and make that happen. So I don't have to do this every time. But for now, um, we just have to look at it this way. Okay, so this is uh, long only trades. Interesting, I, I didn't pay attention to this before, but it's very similar um, in the return and the drawdown, almost identical, um, mm -hmm. but much less trades as you can see here. Let's see how that sector performance looks. All right, um, all of them are positive except for this red line, which is number five, and that's energy. So actually energy shorts, contribute a pretty good bit because you can see if you just traded long energy it would be um below zero return so that's kind of interesting I'm, I'm pretty sure this blue line up here is bonds let's see that's seven oh no that's metals and then this is bonds um, when I ran this on my system that I'm trading now bonds were an overwhelmingly um, positive, like up here. It's pro probably because I have more bonds in my portfolio than this does. This only has uh, the 10 year and the Japanese government bond in it. Um, and I think I have three or four in my portfolio. So that, I guess that makes sense. Um, but um, what's this darker one? Four equities. So equities has been a pretty wild ride. I guess this is just reflecting this week, probably this give back <laughs> uh, at the end of the test, where we've had a pullback in all those markets. Because I'm sure this is uh, this system is probably still long. Um, all the yeah. markets. So if you would have run this test two weeks ago, this would look drastically different, which is an interesting interesting thing, right? <laughs> Yeah, especially when you consider like um, like December 2018 definitely doesn't even register. So it must have been, maybe it was out of it by then in December 2018 when we had the last real rundown in equities. So. Oh, yeah. It's very, yeah. I mean, I mean, it just looks like it went crazy. <clears throat> So I feel I feel like you're only uh, confirming the panic that people are having in equities right now. 
<laughs> well, I mean, that's if you're following the trend, I guess you have to follow the stupidity as well as the smartness, right? <laughs> yeah. All right, so let's see what the uh, the short trades only look like. And uh, this is going to probably look uh, much different. And possibly scary. Well, this is interesting. So in 20 years, uh, trading shorts only, you would have made a grand total of $5,000, 5% over 20 years. So you definitely don't want to trade the short side uh, alone. And to get that 0.25% compounded annual growth rate, you had to live through a 32% drawdown. So I don't <laughs> think that's a return a risk return profile that anybody wants to trade, but it is still profitable. Um, let's see what the sector performance looks like. All right, so the yellow line right here is the break-even line. So anything that finished below that was a losing uh, asset class. Anything above it uh, positively contributed. So uh, number one, the blue line is grains. So it looks like being short grains is um, even worse than just trading grains in general. Um, number two is ags, which is the green line. That's actually not a bad uh, return profile. Looks like it's better than 10% over the life of the test. Uh, black line is FX, which is pretty decent. And that makes sense because you're not really short if you're short any FX contract, you're long another con another currency. Um, right. So it's almost not fair to, to think of FX futures as longs and shorts. It's almost just being long and short two different things all the time. So that makes sense to me. Um, the olive line is energy, which is here. So energy shorts, not a bad thing. Uh, five is equities, the red line, um, slightly positive. Which, um, you know, that's, I'd say that's a definite good thing to see because it seems like uh, most people are making the, will make the case that um, shorting equities is a negative proposition which kind of gives, uh, even if it adds a diversification benefit or gives you some uh, returns at the worst time, I feel like if it if it comes out negative, then it just adds a bit more to that narrative that it maybe doesn't have any value. But um, certainly in this case, you can see that it added a positive benefit throughout 2008 and into 2009 yeah. goes up there. And it's been and bleeding... Bleeding money a bit ever since then, I think. Um, but it's still positive overall over this time. Uh, and it's going to give you in those deeper, um, deeper <clears throat> pullbacks uh, some actual diversification and positive performance. So yeah, I would say that that's kind of a win for, for short equities. Yeah, nice gain here too back in 2001 um, during the tech bubble blow up. Um, and run this again in three, six months, this might look much different mm -hmm. uh, if things keep going the way they're going now. Um, six. So metals, I believe that is here. Or is that four? Some of these colors are a little bit hard to see. That's another something I can maybe mess around with and change the colors to make this a little easier to see. Uh, seven stirs, pretty much negative. Um, and then eight, the red line is bonds, pretty much flat. So um, there's the short side. But you can see everything adds, um, except for, what was blue again? Grains. Oh, there's another one down here, too. Oh, but this, this jumped up here. Well, this again, black. Three FX. Okay. Um, so after this, I showed this 
to Adrian and some other people and um, someone else asked me, they're like, well, how much total return did the bonds or not the bonds, sorry, did the shorts contribute um, to the system? And so what I did for that, let me find my um, trade log here. So trading blocks produces a trade log from every test. Sorry, hold on just a second. I gotta minimize this. I'm running, I'm back to running two screens. Um, <laughs> I have my, uh, my master of the universe trading set up on my kitchen table right now, which my wife absolutely loves. <laughs> <laughs> Um, so this is the trade log for the whole test. It shows every trade, every entry exit um, for every asset. And so what I've done down here at the bottom, I've calculated, um, I've just added up all the R returns for the long trades and the short trades. Um, so you can see that you got 208 R from longs and only 12.8 longs from shorts. Um so about 5% or so uh, comes from the shorts. But like we, like we highlighted with the equities, those short returns um, during certain time periods of 3, 6, 12 months might be where all your return comes from. Um, so while it doesn't look like a lot over the span of 20 years, it may be what keeps you... Um, keeps you in the game trading to have that that return when you need it when everything else is um is not doing so well um yeah just as important as the actual uh sort of numbers or metrics and stats around it is the uh the timing of it as well so i think you yeah. some people could definitely make a case to to not have the shorts but that would require um, sort of further further criteria and analysis to come to that conclusion and the effect that no, it didn't actually do it at uh, any meaningful time for diversification or reducing um, drawdowns overall or some other types of parameters. But just looking at uh, at least starting with the numbers like this, it wouldn't it shouldn't really lead you to say, oh, I'll just um, I'll drop the shorts. Yeah, I, I was going to look and see. Confirmation that I need to keep the shorts. I need to look further um, for another reason to potentially eliminate them. If I was inclined to do so. I was going to see if adding the shorts lowered the uh, the volatility of the of the return sum. So you can see the annualized daily of the long and short trading was twenty one point three. So let's see what long only is. If it's a higher, or lower, or equal volatility. That's actually lower being short or being long only. So that kind of uh, doesn't really help over the life of the test, but I'm sure during certain periods, um, it's going to make it a little more comfortable to trade. Um, so when I did this with the system that I'm trading now, uh, like I mentioned, I saw a huge return uh, just coming from the bonds. And my test period. Um, is over the last 30 years, which pretty much coincides perfectly with the bull market and bonds and equities. Um, and it's not to say that the next 30 years won't be the exact opposite, where yields are constantly rising, bonds are constantly falling, um, and you have the exact opposite. So if you looked at this past 20 years and said, well, it's not even worth trading the shorts. For the next 20 years, the bulk of your returns could come from being short bonds or short whatever, right. or just long commodities. If you look at this test and you say, oh, well, commodities didn't add a whole lot. Um, all the returns came from stocks and bonds. I'll just trade stocks and bonds. That doesn't mean that's what's going to happen um, in the next market regime. Um, so what I was hoping that I could do and what, um, 
I may have to do some more work. What I'd like to do from here is to start to figure out a way to look uh, at the R return for each asset class. Um, trading blocks as it, as it is now doesn't support that. Like in the trade log, I don't, I can't, um, I can't sort by asset class. Maybe that's something that I can add going on down the line. Uh, but to see, you know, asset class by asset class, how each um, contributed on the long and short side, I think that would be interesting to see. Um, so maybe that's maybe that's the next step with this uh, for me, well, for each, just out of interest. Well, for each but, trade in the trade log, it does give you the market, right? Yes. So if you knew how the market went in, how they uh, d divided up each asset class, you can probably. Uh, pretty easily create that field even just directly within the Excel document. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's just true. go just go within the, <clears throat> the groups of markets that you know are in each asset class and just add add a um a value in each cell for those that qualify for the asset class and create your own even though it's out of trading blocks. But once you get um all the other data at least at the mar market level then you can aggregate it back up um at that time so that shouldn't be too bad it's just outside of it's just sort of outside yeah, that's of trading a, blocks that's a good point and for 20 markets that's you could do that pretty quickly yeah um, so yeah i'm gonna make a note to myself to do that as always um the uh, most obvious thing to do uh, often doesn't come to my mind <laughs> <laughs> uh but um I don't know. What do you have any uh, any anything you want to add on this? Any thoughts? Um, I mean, I think it's what we'd expect from, you know, a relatively standard um, parameter set for that for that model. Definitely, I would say it's long term, long, mid mid long to long term. Um, so you're probably going to get some more of those. Uh, deeper drawdowns because you're holding through it, trying to wait out those retracements. So, I mean, um, it's definitely representative of what you would see as a, like a starting building block trend following system that you'd, that you'd use and try to try to tweak to, to maybe improve some of those metrics, but it's certainly, certainly reasonable. Um, and I think it's just a good, uh, good exercise to show some more of the, um, capabilities of trading blocks. I know a number of different people have sort of reached out and just inquired about it. Um, uh, so this just gives a bit more exposure on some of the, the things that it can do and using um, whoever it is that's the uh, creator or owner uh, as a resource uh, too, because he's still, I think he's still available for, uh, for you know some some requests from from the users to expand the software um, a bit as as uh, as available. So um, yeah, I don't know that anything totally surprised me in looking at the uh, the numbers. If you, since you're more familiar with how this kind of system works than I am, what would you say is the like most short-term version of this that you would think would be viable? Because I was thinking what might be interesting to do just without knowing, just from a, from a guess, I would imagine that the short trade return would improve with a shorter-term system. Um, just because if you have more kind of range-bound markets you might catch just as much downside return as you catch upside return. So I was thinking what I'd like also like to do is run this at like a short term level and see if that the balance between the long return and the short return evens up a little bit. Yeah. Um, I feel like to me, the, the, sh the shortest thing that I'm that I that I look at or that I've had any reasonable amount of success with related to like breakout period um, 
And if you're thinking about 250 days, would be around like the, the 40 to 50 day range. Uh, and then the ATR and those things can scale down somewhat uh, proportionally, I guess. Um, so you I do like- know, I mean, if you wanted to try and do, if you wanted to try and scale that down proportionally from the 200 and or 250 level, you can, you could kind of get a pseudo comparison um, of this and the 40 in, 20 out uh, strategy that's that's on Twitter. Um, and I can't remember his first name, Straussman. Can't remember his Andrew? first name, but it's at Andrew, yeah. Um, yeah. So his tw- and the Twitter is at 40 in, 20 out. And that's just 40-day um, breakouts, go into the position, get out when it hits a 20-day low. The ATR is set at, I think it's one. Um, and it's a one ATR stop? One ATR at the 40 and 20 wow. out. Yeah. Wow. And, the, about- I mean, and he's got um, like a table of the monthly and or annual returns for that strategy. Um, I want to say at least going back somewhere between six to ten years i think that's when he sort of put it together so it's been the actual um performance record of the strategy not based on back tests based on the actual um trading of it within um the best parameters that they have and i can't remember the number of markets but i want to say it's 40 or 50 futures markets um and the results have been uh, quite good, and it's and it's still over the past five to eight years when a lot of people, um, even me included, and and some of the more institutional guys, you know, the short term has been less less profitable overall. It shows sort of these bursts in and out, and some of the um, the index uh, or the benchmarks for the industry. Um, but I would consider that it's certainly not. Um, light speed short term it's still holding things for a decent amount of time especially as they're going up um but 40 days is uh is is a pretty quick quick breakout uh to me mm-hmm. and i think i think that the rules are still available um publicly on on the site as well um but yeah i consider that to be a pretty pretty short term and tight parameters i just ran um so i did a 50-day breakout a two atr initial stop um the 20-day moving average and then two atr trailing exit um and it has a 10 percent return and a 75 percent drawdown (laughs) <laughs> over the, the same period and when i've when i tested all this stuff originally um you know trading blocks was founded by curtis faith who was one of the turtles and it has the turtle system built into it so i think everybody who buys it initially when they buy it they just run the turtle system because they want to mm-hmm. see what it's done and that's kind of been my result with anything shorter term especially over the last 10 years um, the return isn't terrible, but it just it has a terrible, terribly high drawdown. Um, trading at the same volatility level that you would trade um, a longer term system. Right. Um, well, let me see real quick what the yeah. uh, if I the think short that I would R. Agree with some of that as well. But it's just been yeah. that's kind of why I haven't really gone down the road of. Uh, much shorter than even the 40 or 50, but kind of my preferred shorter is around like somewhere between 70 and 100. Yeah. Do you tend to try to um, match the the moving average with the breakout, or it all depends? Uh... No. No. Yeah, so do you it, use the 200 day for everything or are you just I don't use the 200 day. I don't use the 200 day. Mine are set at um 
If it's trading on the day, I mean, it doesn't matter. If it's trading on daily or weekly, it's to that 20 periods. Okay. And four and a half. Oh, okay. That's still... That's interesting. I was just going to run this again. I wanted to see if the... Um, so that would be... Short... That was kind of like my core where I started. Somewhere around like a 80 to 100 day breakout. Get your ATR stop in. Then I added the, the trailing average around that moving average. So there's no okay. rhyme or reason... There's no rhyme or reason that those uh, configurations of parameters should be um, successful, unsuccessful, the best or the worst. It's just the performance was pretty good for me, and I went with it. And yeah. then just scaled up and down to get some longer, longer, shorter term systems on it. I gotcha. Sorry, I was trying to do this. Um... Just see, calculate the R return of these, of the shorter term system and see if it improved any uh, on the short side trading the shorter term system. And it's still pretty high on the long side. While I'm doing this, um, maybe we can bring up your, um, you're a bit of a famous uh, Twitter post on Friday. I know it got some attention talking about your weekly return and your yearly return. <laughs> uh, uh, what do you think? You feel in the, I mean, I feel like you're in the right spot right now. Um, I eased up on bonds a little bit because they were getting out of control. I had to make that decision myself. Um, because it's mostly centered around bonds and, and equities with some other things thrown in and, a de and all my currencies still. Currencies have actually yeah. been pretty good as well during most of this time. It's just the outsized returns have been due to, uh, to the bonds, obviously. Because I've still been long. Um, I've still been long the S&P this entire time. It's been dropping all year. So um, it hasn't... Uh, I mean, I guess it has hurt my performance. I'd, if I was out of it, I guess I'd be up close to 100%. But, uh, yeah, so last Friday I was up 4.5% for the week and the month to date. They're the same right now. I was up 24.7%, and the year to date was sitting at 75.7%. Wow. But, but, like I said, you're always going to give something back as a trend follower. And especially if you know what your somewhat anticipated drawdown levels are, this could be the time where it comes back and gives you my the standard expected drawdown, which is probably somewhere around 40, 50 percent um, for me when you're rolling, running that kind of volatility. My portfolio on average has been moving over uh, 2 percent a day. So it's probably creeping in like 35% annualized vol level, which is quite high. Yeah. Um, and I also have already experienced uh, a 60 to 65% drawdown uh, throughout 2018 into the beginning of 2019. Um, so I made a few adjustments as a result of that because it was too much into currencies. That was before I was trying to expand the portfolio get some more capital in there, branch out, get some more diversification. So that was mostly my response to that and cut my exposure in currencies um, in half to make more uh, capital available to the other markets. So yeah. um, in some way, it means that I've been through both sides of the, both sides of that coin, a quick 60 per, a very quick 75% run up. Cause it's only been what? 10 weeks. Uh, <laughs> 10 weeks or so, and the 60% drawdown was over about nine months, maybe, with two really bad months in there. Two, two months over 25% uh, losing months in that 60% drawdown. So, yeah. Um, even though I just started posting these uh, weekly updates, be sure that the uh, 
the negative weeks will definitely come, and I'm aware of that. So I'm kind of uh, I'm not getting too excited because I know the give back um, will occur, and know the pain of that initial drawdown. Since obviously I'm still in the drawdown. Well, hopefully um, the ten year will just go to zero <laughs> percent in the next two weeks, and then I figured then it'll be... definitely get the fifty basis points pretty quickly, and then we'll see what. We'll see what happens. I'm not. I'm not going to rule out the possibility of zero, and it certainly seems like it's going that way. And well, that's fine. Uh, I'm just looking now at the um, at the overnight markets. Um, I had to. I had an order to fill tonight. Um, I just sold the Nifty, uh, the Indian stock. Uh, stock index um, and opened at nine o'clock. I just so put my order in, got filled at 10,615 and it's already 10,630. <laughs> so volatility, um, right. volatility is running hard right now. The S and P is down four and 4.4%. Um, Oil is down 21.3%. Um, and a lot of currencies are moving as well. We quickly looked at those, but obviously the ruble is directly involved. Um, Canadian dollar is highly linked to oil production and use. So that's uh, taking a hit. And I don't totally know the uh, rationale for the peso moving, but it is. I mean, Mexico's got a pretty good bit of oil production, um, and it's. I think the, the the oil company is a national asset in Mexico. Uh, Pemex, mm -hmm. I think, is the company, and it's nationally owned, so I guess it kind of makes sense um, for the currency. But yeah, the, the RAND is down almost 2%. I don't know, does South Africa have a lot of oil production? Um, that might just be an emerging market. Um, an emerging market reaction. But Bitcoin is down almost 12% tonight. Um, volatility is definitely back. Um, if you're new to trading, this probably seems very strange if you started trading in the last couple of years because it's been <laughs> such a low vol environment. Um but the, a lot of the last couple of weeks, I keep getting the feeling of how much this feels like 2008 to me. Um, like you see these days, like especially in stocks where you have the big down days, but then the very next day you'll have an up thousand point rally in the Dow. Um, you saw a lot of that in late 2008, early 2009. Um, I remember when TARP got announced. Um, the Dow rallied like a thousand points then, which was, um, you know, an even bigger percentage move than it is today. And everybody's like, oh, this is the bottom. We're saved. You know, everything's good from here on out. And then it just the next day it was down again for the next week. Um, right. But this this feels like that again to me. And what that means, you know, who knows? But um yeah, these are think, real. Uh, these are real moves that are happening now. Even though I eased up, eased up out of bonds, so I haven't really looked at it. But I just did a quick, like a quick check and against what it would have been. I think if I would have kept my same positions, I'd be up. I'd be up already uh, six percent today since the market opens. Wow! Since it opened, <laughs> yeah. Because the I'm bond up. was up over a percent, and I'm and right now I have like uh, eight times much exposure to um, bonds than equities, and then some uh, of the other things. I'm have as of t as of right now. This is the best day I've had uh, this year so far. Whether that stays or not um, remains to be seen, but. Um, it feels good. I had a last Monday for me was a really bad day. I was down like 5%, I think, um, on Monday alone. 
and um, it hurt, and I kind of fought back the rest of the week. I was still down for the week, still down for the month, uh, pretty good, and just under um, the flat line for the year. Um, so my trend following uh, mojo hasn't really kicked in yet. I'm I'm ready for it to happen. Um, right. But I mean, even like I, I was holding a, a very traditional portfolio in 2008, um, basically just long a bunch of stocks. And um, I'm very, very happy to be uh, trend following now. It's like it's way more comfortable. Um, I don't really have the fear that I think a lot of people tend to experience. Even I mean, it doesn't even have to be trend following, but. I think it's a, this is a good environment to um, just to show how important it is to have some plan, like ha- have a plan in place before all this stuff happens. Cause it just makes it so much easier on you um, psychologically, not having to make a decision um, in the heat of the moment, which yeah. I, I, I did a lot in 08. Um, I still remember I can remember like three trades that I made in 08 where I sold a stock like within a week of it bottoming, like the a generational bottom. Um, (laughs) I had Freeport McMoran in 2008. I sold it below $10 and I don't know where it is now, but it's been, I think over a hundred since. So not only would I have made back all the losses that I incurred in that one year, I would have probably, you know, quadrupled my money from my original entry had I just held on or had some plan. Right. In, you know, even to get back in if I did sell. Get um, back in at 40. Yeah, and then you still double. You know, you probably still would have doubled your money um, since then. Um, so, I don't know. I'm just, I feel very, very comforted now that i have just i'm on i feel like i'm on cruise control i can watch all this stuff happen i don't have to think about it critically i just run my orders at the end of the day and it tells me what to do based on the decisions i made ahead of time before it got the way it is now so um and i don't think you have to do that with trend following if you want to do it as a value investor or you want to do it as just a a um a long only momentum style strategy, but anything that you can do where you don't have to make decisions when the S and is down 5% and you're sitting there, do I sell? Do I not sell? Do I sell? Do I not sell? You know, have a plan and just uh, stick with it, whatever it is. It'll make it easier on you. Yeah. And Second part of that is pretty much whatever you're expecting to feel during moves, double it or double the double the the average moves and then see how you might feel during that. So like the last two weeks, my average daily movement has been 3% in my portfolio. So that's like a 48% annualized standard deviation, which is pretty volatile. Granted, most of those days have been up days, but um, you still get nervous on some up days because you can see one one quick reversal and it's gone. So I generally don't. I generally would be fine looking at like uh, quarterly quarterly type updates, and this is also one of the reasons why I don't use um, total account value or adjust positions on a daily basis because i've had this insane run-up and all these positions are still open um so if i'm getting in at these levels that that just feels like potentially sizing up um when you know natural reversals happen even if it's just small pullbacks if you if you increase your your position sizing at that time you need less and less of a pullback to um counterbalance more of those gains um, because there's more more money and exposure in those so i think that's i think that's definitely 
if you're running a lower volatility uh, portfolio, you can get away with that because your swings aren't as massive. But as you increase your volatility, I would definitely be, you know, think about your frequency for uh, new position sizing and or modifying current positions or anything like that. Because if I'm up 75% right now, new trades are almost twice the size as they were just on January 1. Yeah. And I don't know if I like, uh, I don't know if I like that kind of luck and sequence timing uh, to be dependent on it. So you definitely have to think about that. Yeah. I saw you, uh, kind of as a aside to that, I saw you, um, you engaged with, I believe it was Adam Butler about, um, he posted some research on, I guess, timing luck with momentum strategies, whether you use like a month end rebalancing or a year, whatever it was. Um, yeah. It was like, like the month end and or if you did all your trades based on the open or the close. Because one of those okay. days, the it, it closed the day before or where it opened. Um, where it opened was like four or 5% higher than where it uh, closed the day before or over the weekend or whatever. And so yeah. if you are removing the randomness and timing luck of both the day of the month that you decided to determine was the frequency, not just the end of the month, but if you just decided split it up throughout the month, you did a 12 month look back for every day in the month. Well, then you'd have your portfolio split up into like 30 parts because you'd be doing one thirtieth each day of the month, or I guess one, 122nd in terms of business days, however you want to think about it. Um, so you'd have you'd have your portfolio, your frequency split up that. And then if you were doing some based on the open and close, um, then you can double. Then that would be doubled from 22 to 44 um, different, different timing components of your monthly frequency on a 12-month look back, which I get. You're trying to remove the timing luck. Um, and he definitely is coming from the institutional side. And that's part yeah. of what one of their main strategies is. It's looking at all of that. So it has these different, I would say, unique frequencies that are over 100 or 200 throughout the month to create that blended light switch kind of dimmer look. So you're, you're on a scale of 0 to 100 continuously. You're invested in whatever market or asset class rather than it being more um, binary or on and off and you're blending them. So I, I definitely understand it. Um, my point was just maybe what is your expectation for the, the retail guy? And I get it. He's an institution. So he'd maybe just right. want people to get into his product. He would just say, get into, get into our fund or ETF, which makes sense. And my point was it, well, if you're, but if you're a retail guy and you're doing it yourself, you will have to find the balance of sort of how many different periods you can have, um, before you can get automated and just have something sent for you um, to do all those. Because you're creating 44 times more more work with a benefit, reducing some of the timing uh, sequence luck, which is important. Um, it's just where would you draw the line? I guess you could say the same thing about trend following. Um, of course, you're going to be better off trading five different systems and five speeds and scaling in and out of trades. But that doesn't mean that trading one system isn't better as a retail trader than not doing it. Right. Is it the same with momentum? I mean, how much of a difference, I guess his point was using one example, right. Out of however long you're, in, in, one, in one market or one asset class, which is kind of what they were yeah. in anyway. So you do have to take that a little differently. They're specifically talking about um, equities. And the angle was mostly like, well, if a manager's doing it, they have some career risk or they're going to get fired. So if they, instead of buying the, instead of getting out at the close or the open, um, it was a difference in four or 5%, which, you know, depending on what you're doing, that might have been, you know, saved your week or saved your month or whatever you're reporting on and things like that. Um, luckily, I don't concern myself with those things. 
I like to yeah, look at. If you had been in the trade for the last 10 years, yeah. 5% on the end of it is the difference that you would pay them in fees to do it for you is probably more than what you gave up with the bad luck. That's possible. Yeah, that's just an, and that's why, you know, just think about if you're, if you definitely want to get into it or manage it yourself, you can do some things that are simple that reduce some of that. Uh, and then you're not paying fees, your own weekly or a monthly update. And you just, you're just living with it, you know? You're still going to have, you still might have a down, you know, if if it's a, just a straight down month and it just happens the entire month, you may still have a 25% or 30% down month. So yeah, you do want to have, you do want to change up some of that, um, the timing. It certainly would help. Um, And I wouldn't be opposed to like, even just breaking it down uh, weekly instead of uh, monthly as well. And just doing it based on that. Um, but yeah, you're still, you know, I get it. But the 12 month look back has still been uh, pretty strong and pretty simple. And yeah. if you're just getting started or you want something <clears throat> that's uh, suited for like uh, the retirement accounts that you have that may have some restrictions uh, and the things that you get or you can't really get in there easily, then you want to do as few, few trades or logins or whatever into your account. Um, as possible and also for the average person fewer logins will help their emotional stability yeah i had tried not looking at my account um at all like returns until the end of the week Uh, that's kind of gone out the window with what's been happening um over the last couple of weeks but i was I was much happier uh, when I wasn't so worried every day about what's going on, but yeah. I don't know. It's kind of, I it's kind of like watching the car it. crash. Like you, you don't want to look, but it's hard not to, I guess. Yeah. I have to see it every day since I have like multiple accounts. So I bring them all into one spreadsheet just so that I can see each of them are doing themselves. And then what the portfolio level is doing if I'm combining all those accounts. So I have to do it just to be able to track my the daily numbers, so I see it sitting there. Um, yeah, and it's been it's been fine. But like back in January, I had a down nine percent day, and a seven and a half percent day. But I think that same Monday that you had problems, I was up almost twelve percent. Yeah, so rub, rub it in, rub it in. <laughs> <laughs> that, was, that was one of the good days yeah. and the day before that was nine so i was up over 20 percent in a two-day span which is quite wow. ridiculous yeah it's we'll see ridiculous. The, i think the well the friday before i was down i had a bad week week before last two but i was like on cruise control before that um and that can up. those positions are still in place so i mean that can easily happen this week where the market just goes back to where they were. And so I could be down 20% in two days because those positions are still the same size. The stop isn't, hasn't really moved yet. It's only one week, one and a half weeks of movement, which is nothing when you're medium, medium to long term, unless it has a really big spike. Um, and these have been big moves, but they haven't been like spiky where it just completely takes my exit or my stop loss way up. It's not been out of the ordinary. I've like gotten the oil, pretty the oil bad. one today would be a bit out of the ordinary. I bet yeah. if I look at the oil on my trailing stop, it, it it used the second part of it where it looked at like the the two times the ATR, like nine ATRs away or something. I don't want to be outside of that. So it just you you just see it kind of fall straight down and then readjust to its new higher point because of the huge um, gap down and spike. Like that's a much more violent move than anything that really happened in equities or bonds, in my opinion. It's just the yeah. bonds have just been going up every single day, a good percentage yeah. every single day, like 50 basis points to a percent and a half every day. Unlevered. So when you're levered, yeah, yeah. it's moving. The yen got me bad. I think I got a 
uh, like a one R worse, worse exit than planned uh, when the yen, um, I was short yen and it was down 2% the day that my, my exit got triggered. And I think it down another percent the next day. So it blew way past what my right. um, estimated exit was um, not the end of the world, but um, I think we're going to see a lot we're going to see more of that happening. I think as this, whatever this period is, uh, continues, you're going to see more and more volatility. Um, volatility begets volatility as they say. Right. Um, well, so. it should be interesting. It'll be fun. Probably, hopefully. <laughs> it'll be interesting regardless. It'll yeah. to be determined if it'll be fun. <laughs> yeah. I'm um I'm like a little bit relieved that because I feel like I've been waiting on a period like this since I started trend following and it just hasn't happened. It's been just super low low volatility, uh, but then it's like scary at the same time. <laughs> um, so I don't know, but it's still happy to have good a plan. Experience. And, it's yeah. good experience. Yeah. Well, we are over the hour mark already but i did want to uh bring up so david dubinsky who we've talked to before uh and answered a question for before reached out and he is looking um for a python developer to do a little project for him um i don't know any python developers my my entree into um coding has come with trading blocks just in the last few years um, so I thought I'd mention it on here. I'm sure we have a Python enabled person watching somewhere. Tom Basso uh, is looking for someone as well. Okay. So uh, not to overshadow David with uh, Tom's <laughs> problems, but, and, and they might be looking for different uh, things as well. And so maybe they're both on the same path, but yeah, he's looking for basically someone to, uh, come on board and work with him doing um, some development and automation that he wants to do. He wants to get back into um, making his process more automated just to remove some of the time. So he wow. didn't, um, he didn't, you know, explicitly or directly say anything regarding the role or compensation, but I don't think anybody needs to know that definitively, depending on who you're going to work for and the exposure experience you might be able um, yeah. to get. So either of them, if you're familiar um, uh, with either of them, maybe, uh, yeah, give them a shout and see if you are a good match for either of those. Yeah. Um, also, I, I, I am not. I, I not. do not know Python yet. I, I tried. I've tried a couple of times. Um, I did the MIT Open Courseware uh, mm -hmm. entry to Python class, um, and then I did some some classes in Udemy, like the uh, the mm -hmm. online um, thing. Yep. And then I, you know, I read Andres Kleinow's book and started um, doing, you know, the stuff with. Uh, is it quant quantopian or whatever it is? Um, but I'm so entrenched in trading blocks at this point. Um, I'm just going to stick with that. I don't, I don't have enough time to do two different programs and languages. Um, but I think David is using trading blocks. It made it sound, he made it sound like he was trying to find a way to um, get somebody to set up a database in Python where he could look at his brokerage return and his trading block simulation and try to, like, I guess, compare the two with each other. Um, yeah, that's an interesting project. So um, if anybody's interested in, um, in working with David, either let us know or let him know on Twitter. Um, but, yeah, I guess we're, um, we're well into our allotted time here. Yep. Um, I just looked again, oil is down 22% now. So it's like, this is, this is crazy. In 1990, um, there was an oil move like this and then Iraq invaded Kuwait and then oil did a complete reversal and went the opposite direction. I think of the same kind of move like this. So it was like down 20 and up 20 
within the same week. Um, right. So <laughs> be careful. Don't don't jump on the oil short bandwagon without doing some due diligence. <laughs> yeah. You never know what could happen. And I've already seen one headline that's calling for oil to hit twenty dollars this year. So we'll oh, it's down twenty twenty five percent now. So it just continues to fall. Go stock up crazy. on your oil. Create your own gas, your own refinery. Yeah. All right. Well, we'll leave it there, everybody. Uh, trade safe. Enjoy Have a the plan. volatility. Stick with it. Enjoy the volatility for sure. All right. Until next time. See you.